Come on, let's welcome everybody that's watching on YouTube Live right now, the NASA's campus. We are in the last week, the last week of our summer series in the book of Romans, and uh, it's been a great 12 weeks. I can't believe it's already over, uh, but today we are going to close this thing out with an exclamation point, and I'm excited. I want you to grab your Bibles, turn to chapter 8 of Romans. Come on, if you got your Bible, hold it up. Come on, if you got your phone Bible, hold it up. If you don't have your Bible, that's all right. We got it on the screen for you, but we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. Last week we finished in verse 28. Today we're going to pick it up in verse Verse 31, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, and Paul has given us the gospel. He is, we don't have time to review it, but he's talked about how amazing what God has done for us is, and the crescendo of chapter 8, the crescendo of the whole book of Romans, maybe even the crescendo of the gospel is right here as Paul gives us our response to all of these wonderful things. Verse 31 It reads like this, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who will then condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? For as the scriptures say, for your sake we're being killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Come on, somebody. And I am convinced, Paul says, that nothing, everybody say nothing, can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, if you're thankful for the word of God today, why don't you give him a shout of praise in this place? Come on, if you're watching online, say amen. Come on, this is good news today. It's the good news of the gospel. I love this passage. I love this passage. Paul says, what shall we say? to such wonderful things. And what are these wonderful things? Well, it's everything that he's been talking about. It's everything he talked about in chapter one. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God. And chapter two and three and four as he's talking about being justified by our faith. And it's not up to us and what we do, but it's up to what Jesus already did and our faith in him. Come on, I'm here thankful for that. And And Abraham's the father of our faith, and he showed us that our right standing with God is not based on what we do, but it's based on how we believe. And chapter 6, how we don't take that grace for granted and just live any way, but we take our forgiveness and our grace, and we let it motivate us and empower us to live a life that reflects Christ. Come on, in chapter 7, he's saying, don't go back to the law. Don't go back to the old way. Come on, we're going to live this in this faith the same way that we came in, and it's by grace. And then in chapter 8, as he's talking about the Holy Spirit and God working everything together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then he says, so what's the response, everybody? What's the response to this? What shall we say? And And he starts to do something that he hasn't done yet in this letter. He asks a bunch of questions, rhetorical questions. And and some of them he doesn't even answer because the answer is implicit. The answer is in it. Like, we obviously know the answer. Some of them he answers the question for us and with us. And you see him, like, what you see Paul doing in this letter is he's causing the audience to be pulled into this experience. He's pulling everybody in. He's rallying everybody around. He's going, what shall we say? What what is our response to all of these things? And, And you notice, even as I read today, As I ask the question, you almost like feel awkward because you kind of want to answer it. Some of you even did answer it. You know, what can separate us from Christ's love? You want to be like, 
Nothing, I guess. <laughs> you know, like who, if God didn't even spare his own son, but, but he gave him, don't you think he's going to give you everything else? And it causes you to be like, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. Like, it makes you think. It makes you process. It pulls you in. And so this strategy that Paul is using is like, come on, let's, let's all gather together and rally around these truths that, that God has given us victory, that God is never going to leave us, that God loves us unconditionally. He brings us face to face with these realities. He pulls it out of us. He wants us to experience this today. Has anybody ever been to, to the sports game? You know, maybe it's a professional team or college or even high school, and, 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 and your team does good. They score a goal. They, 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 they get a touchdown. They, they make a game-winning shot, and everybody goes nuts. Anybody ever been in those moments, you know? Like Redskins fans, when we – oh, never mind. We don't have any of those moments. But Caps fans, you know, like when we have, have great moments together. And, and, and it's like in those moments when – when, when we score that goal or we win that game, everybody goes crazy. And, and, and like I was at a, a Caps playoff game. They did, playoffs didn't end like we wanted them to, but, but they won this particular game this past season. And, and when they score a goal at Verizon, you, it, the whole place goes nuts. The train horns sound. And everybody, you know, th there's people throwing beer in the air and popcorn in the air. And people are high-fiving. You see people hugging they've never met before in their life. And they're like, we just became best friends. And, and you're just high-fiving people across the rows. And it's crazy. Why? Because there is something common among us. We are winning together. Well, we're winning together. The reason that I, I come in today pretty excited Try to be excited every week, but if you can't be excited about Romans 8, 31 through 39, you're never going to be excited. I told one of our leaders before first service at Warrington, I said, man, if I don't preach this with passion, I need to stop preaching. Because this is the climactic moment of chapter 8. This is the response to everything Jesus has done, and it should be like Capital One Arena. It should be like when we're winning a game and everybody's high-fiving, and we're going to finish today, this message today, in a different way. We're going to finish today. All of us are going to reread that passage together, and we're going to celebrate everything that Jesus has done. Some of you came in for the first time here today, and you're like, oh, man, that's weird, or that's going to be awkward. I, I'm sorry today. You came in on a day where we're just going to close it a little bit different because I think that we need to get our hope back, our victory back. Come on. This is a day where we say, what's our response to all of these 11 weeks? What's the response to everything that Paul has been talking to us? What is the response to the gospel? It's a victorious cheerful, celebratory, conquering response. And the church of Jesus Christ, we need to be able, we need to know how to celebrate. We need to know how to worship. I heard worship was amazing here already today. We need to understand how to, even in a tough time, realize that even though I'm going through hell, even though I'm going through a tough time, I'm victorious. It must be my confession. This is good news today. Point number one, I've got three points, you know, try to, to capture what Paul is saying. And, and the, the first thought of today is this. We have a confession of victory. We have a confession of victory. Verse 31, Paul says, what shall we say? Everybody say it together. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? Like, he's saying, he's drawing it out of us. The response is going to be our confession, the response to what Jesus has done is not, oh, it feels good in my heart. That's not the response. The response is a confession. What shall I think? No. What shall I say? What will be my confession about such wonderful things? Paul is going to draw it out of us. And, and what does he do? After he says, what shall we say? It's a confession. He begins to ask questions. In other words, he's trying to get us to confess our victory. He's trying to get us to confess our faith. We must have a confession of victory. I think a lot of Christians, if we're not careful, can have pitiful confessions. I'm talking about what we speak. If you just do a little review of your life recently, and you think about when you wake up in the morning, and the first things that you're talking about, that when you think about work or school, what are you talking about? What is coming out of your lips? When you're with your friends, when you're in your small group, what are you speaking about? Because we as Christians should speak different than those who don't know Jesus. 
because we have wonderful things to speak about. What shall we say about such wonderful things? We shouldn't say, I mean, I don't know. I feel like people are just against me. No, that's not our confession as Christians. My confession as a follower of Jesus, if God's for me, who could ever be against me? What is our confession? As a Christian, your confession shouldn't be, what you speak shouldn't be, I don't know if, if he's going to provide for He hasn't answered that prayer. He's not giving me what I want. He's not giving me what I need. You know, I'm not getting the job. It's not working out like I want it to work out. No, your confession should be, if he didn't even spare his own son, he gave us his best. Don't you think he's going to give you everything else that you need? Quinn, this should be our confession. Yeah, he's not answering that prayer in the time that I think he should answer it, but my confession is going to be that he didn't even spare Jesus. If he gave me Jesus, I know he's going to give me everything else that I need, and it's going to be in the perfect time. It's going to be in the perfect place. It's going to be in the perfect method. My confession is going to be if he's given me Jesus, he's going to give me everything else that I need. What is your confession? Well, I feel ashamed and guilty, and you know, I don't know if I'm good enough to step into that, or I don't know if I'm called to that. No, your confession should be, who dares accuse those whom God has chosen as his own? If I'm a follower of Jesus, he has taken away accusation, he's taken away guilt, he's taken away shame. He was condemned, he was accused on the cross once and for all, and we get the chance to walk in freedom. Who dares accuse me? That's my confession. Whom God has chosen and called as his own. Our confession shouldn't be, I don't know if God loves me anymore. I don't, I don't feel God. If you're a follower of Jesus, you don't feel God. Your confession needs to be, nothing can ever separate me from the love of God. If I don't feel God, if I feel a distance between me and God, he hadn't gone anywhere. Maybe I haven't been in his house. You don't feel Jesus. When's the last time you read your Bible? When's the last time you come to church? I don't want to be... I don't want to be like that condemning preacher, you know. I want to encourage you today and uplift you today, but I, I do want to challenge you today. You don't feel the presence of God? Well, where are you? What is your confession? A lot of Christians, you complain so much. Your confession will become your reality. Gossip so much. Your confession will become your reality. Negative so much. Your confession will become your reality. Assess your confession. Our confession is here. This is our confession. I pray today that you're encouraged and convicted and challenged by the Holy Spirit of God to start speaking the word of God over your circumstance and stop letting your circumstance speak over you. Say, this is the word of God. Whether I'm hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death, despite all of it, I know who I am in Christ. And I think everybody here today, everybody watching online, we need to change our confession. Don't wait for your circumstances to change. Let the Holy Spirit of God motivate you today and empower you today to confess the word of God. We have a confession of victory. And I love that it's a community confession. What shall we say? Because you might not be in a place of victory right now. You might be in a place of defeat. You might have just lost your job. You might be going through a separation. You might be having trouble with your children and it's consuming you. You might be in a place where you feel like you can't control your mind. You're struggling in your emotions. You might feel overwhelmed by life and you feel like anything but a conqueror. Well, that's when we as the church, that's when your small group, that's when people come alongside of you and put their arm around you and say, hey, we're going through this together, and I know you don't feel like it, but we're conquerors. I know you don't feel like it, but what shall we say to such wonderful things? If God's for us, who can be against us? Come on, this is a community confession. It's a community confession. We, together, have a confession of victory. And no matter what you're going through right now, you're victorious. And sometimes it takes somebody else to help you with that confession. And they'll pick you up in a bad time. And then guess what? You're going to be that person in another season. Confessing for us. When, when I can't confess it, we're going to confess it together. Come on, somebody. When I, when I can't do it, you're going to do it with me. And we'll, we'll watch what it leads to. But point two is this. We are conquerors through Christ. Come on, you know all of them are going to start with the same letter. First one is, <laughs> the, fir the first one is, uh, 
we have a confession. Second was we are conquerors. Come on, everybody say we are conquerors. The NLT says that we have overwhelming victory. Your Bible might say, the NIV says that we are more, despite all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ. Verse 37 says this. Um, there's three words in the verse that stick out to me. And, and the first word is the word for conquerors or victory that we read in the NLT. The Greek word for it is what sticks out to me. I'll talk about it in a minute. The second one is despite, and the third one is through. Because this is a very encouraging verse, 37, very encouraging. Despite all that, we're conquerors, we're victorious. Amen. We clap. We feel good about that. But these three words are really important. The first one I want to talk about is conquerors uh, or overwhelming victory in the NLT. This word in the Greek is, is really this, super conqueror. And it's hard, almost impossible to translate, right? Because it, it, so English, it's, we're, we have, we're more than conquerors or it's overwhelming victory. That's the only way to translate it. But it's really like a superhero, super conqueror. And the difference between conqueror and super conqueror or victory and overwhelming victory is like one scholar put it. He said, you know, the great conquerors of history, they didn't just slaughter nations. They, they, they didn't just kill everybody. <laughs> they, I know this is a little like morbid, right? I just went like really like intense just now. But they didn't just kill everybody. There might be some death on the battlefield, but what they would do is they would conquer a nation and they would get everybody to then work and serve them. And the empire would grow. The power would grow. So that what was once an enemy would get overcome and then the enemy would work for the conqueror or the emperor. Now watch, this is very important because this creates an echo from verse 28 to verse 37. For we are super conquerors. If I was naming the message today, it would be super conquerors. Because verse 28, if you remember from last week, just nod your head and act like you do to make me feel better. Romans 8, 28, some of y'all really did. That's hilarious. But verse, verse 28 says, for we know that in all things God works them together for the good, for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Even bad things, he works together for a good thing. So watch this. Super conquerors don't just overcome their problems. Sometimes the problem doesn't even go away. But my Bible says that God takes my problems and he works them together in a masterpiece for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. In other words, what used to be my enemy ends up serving me. What used to be my problem, my mountain, ends up having to submit to the will of God and the purpose of God that is on my life. And God takes what is bad and he doesn't just get rid of it, but if we trust him and walk in obedience and if we walk in rhythm with what God is doing, we love him him, then he's going to take even the bad and work it for the good, making super conquerors out of us, Paul says, for I, I, I know that I'm more than a conqueror. I'm a super, come on, you're a super conqueror today. Turn to the person next to you and say, what up, super conqueror? <laughs> Superhero, come on, that's awesome. And, and, and another word that sticks out is despite, because this just obliterates <laughs> Paul just like completely crushes any prosperity gospel type of thing. Or like you just claim it and you got it. You know, you just blab it and then you grab it. <laughs> he, he, he takes all of that away. It's not like, oh, you, just, you follow Jesus, all your problems go away. Or God's like a vending machine and, and you pray this way and you act this way and then, and then God's going to do it. And if, it's, if it doesn't happen, there's something wrong with you. So pray different or believe more. Like, no, no, no. You're going to have some problems. Right in the middle of the, of the overwhelming victory passage, Paul tells us, <laughs> even in the midst of hunger, persecution, threatened with death, danger, destitute. Wait a second. I thought this was victory. It is. Because despite those things, you have victory. The Bible doesn't say you're not going to have them anymore. It just says, all up in the midst of them, despite all of that, you have victory today. Well, that's the gospel. The gospel is that in the midst of it all, in all of it, despite it all, we're more than conquerors through Christ. Last word that sticks out to me is through Christ. So you, you don't just get victory your way. You got to get victory Christ's way. And Christ got victory by going to the cross. Oh. Dang, but I didn't want to go to the cross, Josh. 
I was praying that he would take the cross away. But the father said, no, you must die on it. <laughs> and after you die on it and you get buried in, in the grave, in the ground, then three days later you will rise. So we have victory, but we have victory through Christ, which means if we want resurrection with Christ, we're going to have to endure death with Christ, which means death of my flesh, death of me, death of my old desires, death of my old way of living, death of my old way of thinking. And as I let my old self die, the new me can be resurrected and come to life. And so I must die with Christ, as Paul already said, and then I get to be resurrected with Christ, as Paul said. So despite all of the mess, despite all of it, overwhelming victory is mine. I'm a super conqueror, but it's with Christ. So it's his time. It's his way. I've got to be submitted to him. I'm not God. He is. But as long as I stay in step with him, I know how the story ends. I might be in a bad chapter, but I know who wrote the last chapter. I might be in a bad season, but I know another season is coming. Come on, be encouraged today that even if you're in a tough season, overwhelming victory is yours if you love Jesus. Side note today is that there is a qualifier through all of this because as Paul is saying, us and we, who's he talking about? Well, remember what we're reading. We, we're, we're reading a, a letter. We, we just picked it up in verse 31, but he qualified it in 28. He, he does all this stuff for those who what? Who love him. Who love him. Like, you don't have to have it all right. Don't get me wrong. Like, you don't have to, you don't have to do a bunch of stuff. You don't have to do religion. You don't have to do legalism. There's one thing that God asks for. Like, he, he loved the world so much that he gave his son to die for everybody. But, but, so that everybody that believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So everybody follow me. God's love is, he loves all of his children so much so that he gave his son while we were still sinners. That's, that is crazy love. He just gave us love. He gave us Jesus before we did anything. And everybody's loved. You're loved today no matter what you believe. You might not believe any of this. Some, you, somebody might have brought you to church and you're not in on all of this stuff. I want you to know you can keep coming. We love having you. I hope that you feel encouraged today. And I pray that one day when you're ready, you'll make the decision to follow Jesus. But if that's not you, okay. But I have to tell you that there is a qualifier for all of this stuff. For those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, many are called. You're called today. You're being called today. Do you love God? Three of you do. The rest of you can just leave because it doesn't apply to you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but that's the qualifier for those who love God. If I love him, if I trust him, then all of this applies to me. Isn't that awesome? And so our confession must be victory. And we're conquerors through Christ. And then point three, and the band can come back up. Point three is we are convinced of God's love. We are convinced of God's love. We are convinced of God's love. I love that his language, I'm going to show you this. His language is we, we, us, us. What shall we say? You know, if God's for us, who could ever be against us? What could separate us? And then he gets to verse 38 and he says, so here's my response. Paul says, so I, everybody say I. I, I am convinced of God's love. So he's been saying we and us and our confession, we're conquerors. And as we get to verse 38 and 39, I'm convinced of this. Here's my prayer today is that you feel the community confession. I might be confessing this for you today. Your heart might be broken today. You might be in despair today, and we don't act like you aren't. We're not here to fake it. It's a big difference. Some people say, I just feel like it's fake. You know, if I come in and worship, when I, how, how can I clap and smile and stuff when I'm going through a hard time? I see other people, I just feel like they're just putting on for church. Well, of course, we know that people can be fake and plastic and stuff, but don't ever go to the other extreme and just think that confessing the word of God and Worshiping God and smiling and having joy means that you're faking it. For Paul says, I rejoice. We read it in Romans 5. I rejoice in my suffering. That's not faking it. That's confessing it. That's not faking it. That's believing the truth of God over your circumstance. 
And, and so today you might be in a really hard place and I might be confessing this for you. This might be the cry of your heart, but you haven't been able to get your mouth to say it. This might be the longing of your heart. I want to believe that, but I can't get my mind to be convinced by it. But guess what happens when you stay in a community? Guess what happens when you stay planted? Guess what happens when you come to church and you show up and you get in the atmosphere of faith? Is we're going to confess it together. And as we confess, as, as we come together, as we get encouraged, your soul can become convinced of the love of God. Paul says, this is our confession. We're more than conquerors. And you know what? Now I'm convinced. This is a man who understood what it was like to go through the tough time. He knew what it was like to be lashed 39 times, multiple times. He knew what it was like to be in prison. He knew what it was like to be without food. He knew what it was like to be shipwrecked. He knew what it was like to be homeless. He knew what it was like to be accused. He knew what it was like. And this same man says, I'm convinced. He's seen enough life. He's seen enough circumstance. He's, seen, he's, he's even seen God greater in the bad times. It might be the bad time that's the greatest opportunity for you to be convinced more than you ever have been about the love of God. My prayer today is that you leave here more convinced of the love of God than when you walked in. And I think that's Paul's point for the last part of this passage, is that our confession, that our faith, will result in you, I'm talking to every single one of you in this place, being more convinced of the love of God than you ever have been before. Because if you can be convinced of the love of God, then it'll dictate everything else that you do. If you can be convinced that God's never going to leave you or forsake you, it'll change the way that you think. It'll change, it'll change your stress level. It'll change your anxiety level. It'll change the way that you operate. It'll change the way that you talk. My prayer today is that every single person in this room, every single person watching online is more convinced after our time together than when we started of the love of God that is shown in Christ Jesus. Can you stand across this room? We're going to end it like this. We're going to end it like this. The band is going to play, uh, the band is going to play Reckless Love. And as they play, we're going to read together 31 through 39 again. This is what I want us to do. I do not want you to read this quietly. I don't want you to read it bashfully. I, I don't want us to read it like in a classroom. Put up verse 31 real quick. I want to show you what we're not going to do. Like when I read this, I was, I was like this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? That something weird happens when classes read together or when churches read together. We all do this thing where we go, we change the speed, and we all sound like we don't know how to read. We, we, this is how we do it usually. We go, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is, we're not going to do that, all right? <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're just going to read it at a normal pace, okay? But as we read this together, as we read this together, we're going to allow our confession to determine our mood instead of letting our mood determine our confession. We're going to allow our confession to determine our faith. Come on, we're going we're gonna to lead with words. Come on, power of life and death is in the tongue. Come on, this is going to be our confession together, and we're going to say it loud. We might even scream it out loud, and at the end, we're going to high-five each other. You might even give somebody a hug, and we're going to celebrate, we're going to cheer, and we're going to sing about the amazing love of God. Can we read this together? Come on, all together. Here we go. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Come on, who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we're killed every day and we're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from Christ's love. Come 
are neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from Christ's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's give Jesus praise.